so hello. Um, I've graded all the exams and also the homework. So you can get your graded homework out of here. And um, so you can get your exams from here. So um, everybody got an A on the exam, so that's good. The, like the lowest grade was a 90%. So um, good. Unfortunately, I fully expect everybody to get a perfect score. But it's, I mean, basically everybody knew what they're doing, and a little peop, a little bit of people are confused about um, the following situation. Um, so it's not actually true that if you have Q adjoined square root of some number of e that the, and d is congruent to two mod four. That does not necessarily imply that the ring of integers is z adjoining root p. And the problem is, uh, this implication only holds if p is square free. Uh, for example, you can take e 18, and then q adjoining square root of 18, which just happens to be the same thing as q adjoining square root of 2. Uh, the ring of integers is not z adjoining square root of 18, despite um, the fact that D, namely 18, is congruent to T mod 4. So that was one thing that tripped people up just a little bit. Um, and actually, that was the main thing. Okay, so our goal today is to finally prove, give a complete proof of finiteness of class groups of number fields. Uh, I also have made the next homework assignment, which is due uh, on Friday, November 16th, which you can get here. And it has uh, three problems. So what I'm going to do is I'll state Litchfield's lemma, which I proved at the very end last time. Then I will um, prove three lemmas that basically just involve lattices in Euclidean spaces and the relation to rings of integers. Uh, in particular, in a sense, I'm going to um, take where I embedded the ring of integers in a product of copies of the real or complex numbers. I'm going to give you a much more carefully formulated map of that form and then prove some more precise statements about it. And after proving those lemmas, uh, I'll prove finiteness of the class group. You can get your exam and your graded homework on the table. So first, Litchfield's lemma said that if we had S a closed so S is sitting inside of Rn, which for simplicity I'll often write as B. And let's assume it's closed, bounded, symmetric about the origin. there's a non-trivial intersection between the two sets. So the conclusion is that S intersect L has a non-zero element. And we just we proved it basically by considering a half S mapping that to D mod L. Um, if, it, if the map were injective, we did a contradiction immediately. So we assumed it wasn't injective. We got two points, and we took their difference, and so on. We were able to construct such an element. And that actually worked only when this volume was strictly greater than 2 to the n times the other volume. But then by a compactness argument, we were able to argue that this is also true in the case of equality. So that's how this was proved. 
Okay, the next lemma is the following. So this is a lemma that uh, I need a little notation before I can state. So let me introduce this notation. Uh, actually, yeah, so I'll, I'll put it over here. So say k is a fixed number field. And suppose sigma 1 through sigma sub r are the embeddings of the number field into the reals. So they're all the ones that have real image. And say sigma r plus 1 through sigma sub r plus s plus 1 are the complex um, conjugate embedding. So for each, so for each complex, oh yeah, plus plus five. I don't have to put that because I'm not doing some funny zero based thing. So for each pair of complex conjugate embeddings, take exactly one at the end. So these are complex conjugate, and these are real. And then you find an out sigma from k into R n as follows. It, um, it sends x to sigma 1 of x, comma, dot, 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 comma, sigma r of x, and then the real parts of each of these, and the imaginary parts of each of these. Uh, this should be r plus x. Okay, so again, you get an n-tuple of real numbers from any element of the number field. And this is the formula. First, you take the real embeddings, and then you take the real parts of half of the complex conjugate embeddings, and the imaginary parts of the other half of it. Well, actually, it's the same half of the complex conjugate embeddings. So this is a map that goes from the field into Rn. And of course, one of the first things we'd like to see is that the ring of integers of the number field maps to a lattice in Rn, which is in fact true. And that's something we'll see um, as a consequence of the first or the second level. So here's the statement. The volume of V mod the image under this map sigma of the ring of integers is 1 over 2 to the s, where s is the number of pairs of complex conjugate embeddings, hence the square root of the absolute value of the discriminant of the field. First, before I go on, are there any questions about the definition of the max sigma? Okay. So here we're just taking the ring of integers, we're mapping it over, and we see that we get um, this non-zero volume. Yes? I have one question about this. N here was R plus 2S, is that right? Mm, or is yeah. N R plus this S? This N now? is R plus S. So, okay, so no, this is by R plus 2S, right? It is, actually, no, it's R plus 2S because you have the real ones and the oh, oh, complex right. ones. Okay. So, so, so we that is the degree of field. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, Because you do take um, sigma R plus S of X all the way up through real part of, oh, I should have started with one here, sorry about that. And then sigma sub r plus s sub x. And that boy's down here. Okay. So here's the lemma. And given that OK is a freely abelian group of rank n, which is of course why you're asking this, this lemma allows you to conclude that um, OK has image that's a lattice inside of V. So this implies that sigma of OK is a lattice. And only that it gives us the volume. And of course, this should look familiar to you. Before we considered, in sort of a loose sense, um, sigma <coughs> is kind of a lattice in something. And there, the volume was the um, square root of the absolute value of the discriminant. So I'll show you how to get this. 
But this is much more precise because we've nailed down an actual Rn, namely the, the image of this map. And um, here, OK really does give you a lot of stuff. <coughs> so here's the proof. So what you do is let w1 through wn be a basis for OK, of course, as a Z module, as a free abelian group. And what we're going to do is consider the image of this basis. So the vectors in this image, well, let's make a matrix whose rows are the images of W1 through Wn under this map. In other words, we're making this matrix, sigma 1, W1, or just sigma W1, all the way down through sigma Wn. Okay, and let's just kind of write this out to see what it looks like. It's sigma 1, W1, dot dot, dot sigma R, W1, and then sigma, and then the real part of sigma R plus 1, W1, dot dot dot, and then finally at the very end, imaginary part of sigma R plus S, W1, and so on all the way down. So that's the matrix. Now what I'm going to do is a sequence of elementary column operations, and you'll see how they change the determinant, and they will transform this matrix into exactly the matrix we used when we were defining the discriminant. And we'll see exactly how the um, determinant changes, and that will give this formula. Okay? So that's the strategy. So the first thing to do is take each of the columns that have an imaginary part, in other words, the last S columns, and add square root of minus 1 times each of those to these columns. That doesn't change the determinant of the resulting matrix at all. But it will give us something that looks more like the embedding we considered before. So um, this is column equivalent to, that's what I mean by this tilde symbol, to the matrix whose, well, this first row looks like this, so sigma 1 w1 dot dot, dot sigma r w1, just as before. And now we have, I'm just going to add i times each imaginary part to the corresponding real part to actually get the sigma r plus 1 w1 all the way up through sigma r plus s w1. And then you still have the imaginary parts sitting here. Okay, so that's what the new matrix looks like. So all I've done is I've added multiples of the last S columns to these columns that have real parts. Next, um, so I'm getting something that looks like before. Next, what you do is you take um, and multiply every single one of the imaginary columns, the columns that are imaginary parts, by 2 times i or actually by minus 2 times i. So I'm going to multiply this column by minus 2 times i. That's a good thing to do because then if we take any of these columns and add them to those columns, we're going to end up with exactly the complex conjugates of each of these. And then we'll end up with exactly the matrix I mentioned in the discriminants um, argument. So doing that, everything here looks exactly the same, but now the imaginary part columns are multiplied by 2 times i. Now that changes the determinant. Each column got multiplied by minus 2 times i, so the determinant of this matrix here is minus 2 times i to the power of the number of columns, which is s, um, times the determinant of this matrix. Okay? Let me write that out a little better. This matrix. Has determinant that is minus 2i to the s times bigger. It's multiplied by that number compared to the determinant of this. Okay? Now, without changing the determinant at all, 
you add each of these columns, which are real part plus i times the imaginary part, to the columns at the end. And that gives you the complex conjugates. So the matrix I wrote down here has rows that look like sigma <coughs> 1, w1, dot dot dot, sigma r, w1, sigma r plus 1, w1 all the way up to sigma r plus s, w1, and then just the complex conjugates of each of these. Sigma r plus 1 bar, w1, all the way up to sigma r plus s bar, w1. Okay, and now this last matrix, um, well, when we define the determinant, I mean, sorry, when we define the discriminant, it was the determinant of this matrix times the transpose of this matrix. So the absolute value of the determinant of this matrix has to be the square root of the absolute value of the discriminant. So this guy has determinant equal to the square root of the absolute value of the discriminant. Okay, Because after all, it's just the matrix that we considered quite a while ago. I mean, it's, if you take this matrix times its transpose, you end up exactly with, um, you know, remember how it worked, you end up with ij entry, the trace of omega, or wi times wj. Okay? So, the fact that this matrix has determinant the absolute value, or the absolute value of its determinant is the um, square root of the absolute value of the discriminant, means that this matrix, and hence these others, have the absolute value of their determinant 1 over, well, the absolute value of this, which is exactly what I wrote here, 1 over the absolute value of this. So the determinant, the absolute value of the determinant of a fundamental domain for sigma of OK is equal to this, hence the lemma. OK? Any questions about that? That thing is the very end. Why do you only consider this for some our terms? And uh, I'm actually, sorry, I mean the whole thing. I'm concerned with the whole thing. So, and I'm not I concerned only with the, the, yeah. the matrix. Was, is, is this the exact? This matrix? is exactly okay. the same matrix. Because right. think about it, we have all the, I just happened to have ordered, when we um, did discriminants, we just took all of the embeddings. There are n of them. And here there are n embeddings. And I just happened to have ordered them with the real ones. Then one, sort of half the complex embeddings and the conjugate complex embeddings. So they're exactly n here. Um, and those, these n are in the concert before. OK? Any other questions? OK, so that's the second lemma. And now, um, the third lemma is actually easy. Giving them slightly out of order. Okay. okay, so the next lemma is just if you have two lattices inside of a common Euclidean space, this one's really straightforward. Um, the volume of v mod one of the lattices is the volume of v mod the other lattice times the index L1 or L2. So um, the reason for this is pretty straightforward. This volume is the determinant of a matrix, say, whose rows are a basis for L2. So the absolute value of, say, that determinant. <coughs> this one, I have to turn it back to that <coughs> around the determinant. Um, this one is the absolute value of the determinant of a matrix whose rows are a basis for L1. And this is the absolute value of the determinant of a change of basis matrix going from one to the other. So, wouldn't those also, like the volume of V over L2 is just the lattice index that we defined before? That's a good idea. Let's do it that way. So it's. <laughs> um, in other words, uh, you could view this as Z to the N colon L2, right? And then you could view this as. Z 
z to the n index of L1 in there. And is that, or do I have it backwards? Let's see. Yeah, it's backwards, actually. Because a, a typical example might be this could be 2 times z to the n. And then, oh, that's right. Okay, that's right. And then this is L1, L2. And then it's just completely obvious. So if you just reinterpret the volume as a lattice index, then you're set. Okay, good. Great observation. Um, since these are equal. Okay, great. So that's done. And now, um, one final lemma, which is pretty easy, which uh, it's also very important. So, the volume of V mod sigma of I, here we consider V mod sigma of the unit ideal, namely OK. Now let's consider the volume of V mod, uh, or the, really the volume of the lattice you get by taking the image of the fractional ideal. So that's what we have over here. Here I is a fractional ideal, and this is 2 to the minus s square root of the absolute value of the discriminant times the norm of the ideal. And you won't be surprised that this is going to be easy to prove given how we just proved the previous sum. So um, here, so for any fractional ideal i, uh, your i is a fractional ideal. <coughs> so, um, is that just two to the negative one? Is it, oh, that's okay, right, that, an S, so it's very stretched up. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little cur more curvature. <laughs> so, uh, there you are. And, um, I guess, I mean, how do I want to say this? Um, so this number right there, that's the volume of V mod sigma OK on the right hand side. And the norm of I is the lattice index in OK in I. So this is the statement I'm trying to prove. Does it kind of look familiar? Um, it's basically exactly the same as this. There's one little slight difference, which is here you have the index of L2 and L1. Here you have the index of I and OK. And to be exactly the same, we should instead have the index of sigma of I and sigma of OK. But these indices don't make any difference if you apply an injective map, which is what sigma is. Sigma is an, I mean, each, it's an injective map. So. Um, you can apply it, the lattice index doesn't change. So the only thing you need is that this is equal to that. Um, technically, you should also observe that sigma of i is a lattice by noting that there's an integer m so that, I mean, for any fractional ideal, you can find some integer so that the fractional ideal is contained in 1 over m times ok, and it contains m times ok. So it's really um, sort of co-finite with OK. So once you make that observation, then everything else makes sense to do. Then you know that um, the image of I is actually the lattice. OK, so that's how you prove this lemma. So we're, this is the thing we're going to use in the, in the actual argument to prove finiteness in the class group. So this is the main one to kind of remember. And of course, it has this other lemma as a special case. If you just set I equal to OK, then it just Simplifies to you that statement. Okay, so we now have everything we need to prove finiteness of the class group, and that's what we're going to do. So we have three, or technically, I guess, four lemmas. Blitchfield's lemma, which says that you have points in an intersection, and then some statements about the volumes. I think what I'll do is um, so. This is really the main statement about volume that we'll use. And of course, Blitchfield's lemma is, is another thing we're going to use. And the other statements I made are just kind of intermediate. 
And of course, the definition of sigma is very important. So just a recopy what I wrote over there. You have your S, which has various properties inside of P. You have a lattice in P. And um, the condition is the volume of S being greater than or equal to T to the N times the volume of B mod L. That implies that S intersect L has a non zero element. So these are the main two facts that we're going to use to prove finding this class group. slightly stronger, namely, um, in fact, well, there's, I guess it's not really stronger, but we'll prove that there's, given any fractional ideal A, I mean I, uh, let me get this straight, so um, there exists C such that for any fractional ideal i, there is an a in k with a times i having norm less than or equal to c. And in fact, this A is an I times found zero. So really, this is an integral ideal. Because remember, uh, oh, sorry, A and I inverse. So remember, I inverse, that's the set of elements of OK that multiply all of I into OK. So this is an integral ideal. So that's what we're going to prove. There's some constant, which of course depends on k, such that every single integral, or sorry, every single fractional ideal is equivalent to an integral ideal that has norm less than or equal to c. And then the fact that there are only finitely many integral ideals up to a given, with norm up to a given bound, implies that the class group is finite. The proof will not exactly be conceptual at least in my opinion. Um, but it's very short. It's, it's quite efficient, and I will be able to finish it. And it's really just, it's not exactly the most obvious application of these two lemmas, but it's not completely complicated. There's a different proof of the same statement, which is very conceptual, but it takes a lot, lot, lot longer. Um, basically, you define adels and indels, which are these restricted topological products of um, completions of your number field and of its ring of integers, and you prove various topological properties about the idels and the adels. Then you get this finiteness statement because you find that the class group, in a fairly natural way, is um, it's discrete and compact. There's there's a there's a topological structure on it in which it's discrete and compact, and hence finite. So there is a completely natural conceptual argument, but it's a lot longer, and you have to develop all kinds of other stuff. That's given in the second half of my book, if you want to read it. And um, yeah. um, also, one other point I should make is you can define class groups for orders, not just for the maximal order. But the problem there is not every ideal will be invertible in an order. So if you restrict to the subset of ideals that are invertible in an order, then you get a class, then you get a notion of a class group. And it's also true that that class group is finite. So this generalizes to class groups of orders. OK, so now the proof. So what we're going to do is basically set up a little bit more structure than just take some random set S and then use it. So and it won't really matter. If we don't want to make things explicit, it won't matter what we choose for our S, as long as it has those properties. Your homework problems about choosing um, a really good S. 
Okay, so let me add just a little bit more structure. So what we have here is we have our number field K, and we've embedded it via the map sigma on the other blackboard into V, which is isomorphic to Rn. And uh, let's define a map on V, which will be very convenient, which I would call F. Uh, it's just a map to the non-negative real numbers. And what it does is it sends um, an n-tuple x1 through xn to <coughs> a slightly mysterious looking, if you think about it, completely natural thing, the product of the first r components times xr plus 1 squared plus xr plus 1 plus s squared dot 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 x r plus s plus x of n which is squared obviously value um, this is natural because you take an element of k and then map it over via sigma and then apply f you just get the norm the absolute value of the norm of that element so notice that a maps all the way over to of course f uh, sigma of a but that's just equal to the absolute value of the norm in k down to q of the element a, i.e. the product of the conjugates of the element. So you have the, here you have all the real embeddings, and here you have the pairs of complex conjugate embeddings. So you multiply all the <coughs> conjugates of your element, that's the norm, that's the definition of norm, and then we're taking in the absolute values, so we're taking the absolute value. situation to give us some, um, uh, some number a, verify that it has this property, and then um, check that you also have this satisfied. 
So we just have to sort of use what we have to apply glitch fields and just observe at the end that we set things up just right so that um, this conclusion is satisfied for some C that's independent of the I, basically. That's the key thing, okay? In other words, we want to, well, you'll see how it works. So our goal is to find, basically find an A such that A times I is small norm, and of course is an integral ideal. So that's what we need to do. And the only thing we really have here that allows us to find something is this. So let's let C be the volume of V mod sigma of I inverse. So remember, you can embed any fractional ideal as a lattice, and then this volume makes sense. In fact, there's a formula for it. This is equal to this number C. It's just equal to uh, 2 to the minus s square root of the discriminant divided by the norm of the ideal i. Do you have another vertical s there? Yep. I don't know why it keeps coming up. This is not an s. <laughs> okay, so we have this c. And the reason I put the i at the bottom is because I put i inverse right. And now, a mysterious quantity that works perfectly for rescaling Rs is the following. Let lambda be c uh, actually two times c over v to the one over n, where v has something to do with s, it's just the volume of s. Okay? So to find that lambda, that's the lambda we're going to rescale our s by and it's just going to work right. So notice that the volume of lambda times s, so of course lambda to the n times the volume of s, because we're in n-dimensional space. When I said s is not empty, I really meant it has a positive volume. It's probably, well, positive volume in n-dimensional space. So volume of lambda s equals lambda to the n times the volume of s. And now lambda to the n, just taking the definition of lambda, that's 2 to the power of n times c over v. And then the volume of s is, of course, v. So this is just 2 to the n times c. So that's the volume of lambda s. So look what we've done. We've exactly just We've, we've just defined lambda so that when you rescale s, you make it exactly big enough so that you can apply glitch fields on it to that lattice. Okay, so this is really a very natural argument. Uh, maybe it's conceptual if you really like geometry. I just don't find it so conceptual. But it is natural. So that's the lattice we're going to use. So let's just do it. I mean, apply glitch fields on it, where this is the set, s, our convex, compact, etc. set, and our lattice is sigma of i inverse. Okay, it's just, we, we just verified that hypothesis works. So apply glitch fill. And glitch fill gives us a non zero E, which is in our lattice, sigma of I inverse. And it's also in our set, which is lambda times s. Because we're applying it to that set <coughs> with this lattice. Now we have a non-zero element. And now, really, the rest of the argument, well, let's see. Yeah, the rest of the argument is just verifying that this non-zero element has all the properties we want. And I mean, that's it, basically. So now let me verify that stuff. But, um, if you wanted to reconstruct this argument, really the thing you need to remember is um, basically just take any s, you don't have to be clever at all with s, you just take any s at all, rescale it so it's exactly the right size, and you just figure out by solving some equation what size to rescale it to, and then you kind of follow your goals and apply glitch build. And now we have to take this b and um, fix it up. So notice first, b is actually an element of v, and we want an element A in K 
So we need to um, just do that. So let A and K be the element be such that sigma of A is equal to B. Okay, so now we have an element A. And now we just need to check that A has all the re requisite properties. And then um, compute a bound on the norm of A times I and observe that the bound doesn't depend at all on I. And then we'll just be in great shape. Okay, any questions? Okay, first, um, oh, okay, first, one thing we need to check is A in I inverse. That was one claim that I made. Well, notice that sigma of A is in sigma of I inverse. So, yeah, that's easy, because sigma is an injective now. So, that was one thing we were really worried about. But A is clearly in I inverse. <coughs> that's easy. Just because it's just the inverse image of something in sigma of I inverse under uh, an injective map. Okay, so that's good. So now we just need to understand the norm of A times I. Now, notice that. Um, So a times i uh, I need to figure out what the norm of that ideal is. And here's what we'll do. So just make it easier. Remember that we proved that the norm of the of a product is the product of the norms. And the um, norm of the principal ideal generated by A is just the norm of A as an element of the field, P over Q. So we have that product. But now um, A, we haven't used yet that it's in lambda S. So let's <coughs> use that. Right? So lambda times S, it's the set which we got kind of by you know, making this set bigger. And now we're considering the norm of some element in lambda times s. So this norm has to be uh, less than or equal to the volume of, sorry, it's less than or equal to lambda to the n times this capital M. Is that right? Because a is in lambda times s, and the function f, its maximum value on the set S is, sorry, the function f, its maximum value on the set S is capital M. So if you just take this set and rescale it by lambda, and note that f rescales by nth powers, the maximum value that f will take, namely that the norm will take, on lambda times S is lambda to the n times M, which is what you have here. Okay, so that's good. And now, um, Let's just unwind this a little bit and see what's going on. The nice thing that we're going to observe is that this lambda has something to do with i. Notice in the definition, we have that. So if we get that the lambda and the i part sort of cancel out, the norm of i and lambda cancel out, we are golden. So, put that email. Um, so let's just fill in the blank. So lambda is 2 c over v to the 1 over n. Of course, it's that whole thing to the power n times m, which is a fixed constant, times the norm of the ideal i. Okay. And now v, um, v was, well, anyways, let's just figure out what happens. So this is 2 to the n times c over v times capital M times the norm of the ideal i. All right. And now v. Actually, now C. C, look at what C is. Thanks, thanks, James. C is T to the minus S square root of the absolute value of the discriminant over norm of I. And we have a C right here and a norm of I, so the two norms are going to cancel, which is wonderful. So, let's write that. So this is 2 to the n times 1 over V times M 
times of just scooting the c over. C is this thing right here. The norms cancel. Then you get 2 to the minus s square root of the absolute value of the discriminant. And now, let's see, what about v here? v is, oh, v is just the volume of s, which um, is constant also. So this is 2 to the n uh, minus s, which is, so 2 to the n minus s is r plus s, because n is equal to r plus 2s. The degree is the number of real places, I mean, number of real embeddings plus twice the number of um, pairs of complex conjugate embeddings. So I'm just writing it this way for nice, so it looks a little nicer times um, you know, this <coughs> m. You have 1 over the volume of s. s is just fixed, you choose at the beginning, times the square root of the absolute value of the discriminant. In other words, there's some constant out front, and then you have the square root of the discriminant. This doesn't in any way depend on capital I. So given any um, fractional ideal of our number field, we can find some equivalent integral ideal whose norm is bounded. And that norm, bound, doesn't depend in any way on the i. So the class group has to be finite. And I'm done with the proof. Three minutes early. So any questions about it? The, the initial claim? Mm -hmm. um, so, so would you really, you're saying that there's a just trying to remember, like this. This is equivalent to what uh, what the, the other class group is finite. Yes, this uh, implies the class group is finite, right? And this yeah. is because. It, so, in other words, that you can find a is it a principal fractional ideal? Yeah. Like such that whatever you take. Well, the principal of fractional ideal is just the ideal generated by a. Okay. The, the equivalence relation in the class group is given an ideal, you get to multiply it by any principal of fractional ideal you want, and you get an equivalent element. So what this says is that any class has a representative which has which is integral and has norm less than a than, than a fixed bound. So every single thing is equivalent to something small. Therefore, the class group is finite. And I, maybe a comment for elliptic curves. There's an analog of the class group, and in general, people have been completely stumped since it was defined in proving that it's finite. So in fact, there are a whole bunch of situations where you have analogs of class groups where we don't know they're finite. This is one situation where we do know it's finite. Um, there's also kind of a naive analog of class group uh, of an elliptic curve, which really just is something related, to basically the mortal vagary of the curve. That's clearly not finite. So there are situations where you have Dedekind domains where the class group isn't finite. That's what happens with elliptic curves. They're, they're mortal vagary group. If you take an elliptic curve, take its function field, then inside of that there's a ring, which is a Dedekind domain, and its class group can easily be infinite. But, so this is a theorem that you know, very much uses that we're in the context of a number field. This is not a general statement about all Dedekind domains. I mean, notice all over the place we're using number fields. That's just like a key central thing in the whole proof. So first for elliptic curves, A, the Dedekind domain genuine analog of class group, whether it's the word analog probably doesn't even need to be used, is not in general finite. For curves, class groups don't have to be finite. And B, the much more subtle object called the Schaffer-Rich tape group associated to an elliptic curve, which is really, in, in a much stronger sense, an analog of the class group of a number field, it is conjectured to be finite, but there's no theorem in general that says it is finite. And in fact, there isn't even a good idea as to how to approach that problem. Okay, other questions about this argument. So, in my one second, just to summarize it quickly, you embed everything in Rn, you choose some set S that has all the properties that Blitzfield Thummer requires, you take your I, you, um, you rescale S exactly so you can apply Blitzfield's Thummer in the optimal possible way, you take the result of Blitzfield's Thummer, you check that you can get from that an element of I inverse, and then you just compute using the definitions that we made um, and other things that we proved a bound on the norm of A times I, and you find that it's less than something that doesn't depend on the choice of the ideal. Yes? So when you stated the, the theorem before, there was like a 4 over pi. And like yes, that so theorem. in order to prove that, what you have to do is compute the volume of S well, over here. It's, it's really right that here. ratio m to the volume. What? 
Well, you also have to compute them. I mean, you have to compute. Basically, you need to compute this stuff explicitly. In order, to do, in order to make any sense of doing that, you have to choose a Hess. Mm. And if you look at the homework, which is right here, which you should get before you leave, you'll see that problem three is making a choice in S. Okay? Sorry to cut off from just trying to little bit. Four over pi sounds like it's probably a ball. Yeah, yeah. You'll see when you do yeah. the problem. Lots of iterated intervals. Woo! Yeah. All right, so I'll see you in uh, just over a week. There'll be class on Friday and Wednesday, but it won't be in the No, I'm going to the airport in a few minutes. Yes, so your tests, all the grade tests are here, the grade homework, and they do homework assignment. So here's a simple proof. Um, the inverse image of a prime ideal is prime, right? Oh, wait, what am I saying? Wait, the inverse image under what? Oh, uh, intersection. Um, I was just saying that. So, so uh, if you have a prime ideal. Every prime ideal is above something. Then, right? Yeah, and then it has that uh, prime in it. So if you have a prime ideal, that prime is in it. Okay? Um, now just P have to divide the norm of P? Yeah, it does. So, and now if you take a product of these, then certainly the product of those primes is in there. So it, in fact, the, the norm of the ideal, there's an integer that divides the norm of the ideal, that's in the ideal. And hence, that the norm itself has to be in there also, just because it's you know, an ideal. So that proves it. Okay. Yeah. The way I was thinking about it was just, you know, find the smallest integer that divides the volume. Uh, mm -hmm. 